All right. Welcome to another episode of Let There Be Talk. It is number seven. 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 Fuck. It's number 702. It's June 19th and it is a Monday. How are you guys? And thank you for joining the show. Lots to talk about today. A lot of new records out. Um, all kinds of other stuff going on. I got some touring happening. And uh, happy late Father's Day for all of you uh, fathers out there. I am the father of Gertie. I mean, uh, I mean, you know, not not technically, but you know, I'm Gertie's dad. I'm Gertie's dad. But <laughs> I don't know. How are you guys? Did you have a good weekend? Had a great weekend. Lots of shows. Was out doing comedy all over Los Angeles. Uh, comedy store, the improv, flappers. Where else was I? Oh, uh, there's a there's a room that's kind of popping off right now called the Bourbon Room. Did a show there Friday night. Me, Ian Edwards. Uh, who else was on that? The Sklar Brothers. Jezelneck and Theo Vaughn. Great lineup. Oh, Melissa Villasenor. Great lineup and great room. Used to be the Cine Space, which was kind of like a club that uh, had like showed movies while you were in there. I remember Jesse James had his premiere there for that fantastic BMX documentary called Joe Kid on a Stingray. And it's still one of my favorite documentaries. If you've never seen it, do yourself a favor and tune into that. It is just smoking, but I had a great memory. We all rode our West Coast choppers down to Cinespace. It's on Hollywood Boulevard, right around the corner from where I do the Bon Scott tribute. And we just lined up all of our West Coast choppers. It was a sight to see. There was like 20 of them. That was back when Bill Dodge still worked at West Coast Choppers. And he he was debuting one of the best choppers I've ever seen called uh, Count Chocula. It was fucking incredible. Still one of my favorite choppers. There's like, there's like five choppers that I think are the greatest of all time. And Count Chocula was definitely a crushing vision. It was a root beer brown heavy metal flake. Um, West Coast Chopper. It was El Diablo, which was, uh, you know, he had the CFL. He had the Dragon, which was the first soft tails. And then he went to the El Diablo, which is kind of the one that Kid Rock and, and Jesse rode on that, that show where they rode to Mexico. Anyway, he showed up. I had never seen Count Chocula. And Bill Wall, who's one of the greatest leather workers in Los Angeles and, and in America, pretty much, made the seat. I'm pretty sure he made the seat with somebody else, but it had a big Count Chocula on the seat. And I just thought that was fucking so cool. Count Chocula, one of my old school favorite cereals, and, and just a great memory. Boo Berry, Count Chocula. Uh, Frankenberry. I think that's the three. Was there one more? I love those. Count Chocula, Boo Berry, and Frankenberry. Just killer. Man, cereal was cool when I was growing up. You get a fucking prize in there? That was so insane. You would get a toy inside your fucking cereal. As soon as you got it home, you just fucking opened it up threw your dirty fucking hand down inside there. <laughs> no washing. Pulled out some dumb little yo-yo or bogus magic trick thing. Anyway, so they all lined up. My top five favorite choppers, I would say. This is what they are. And I've rode a few and owned a few. Um, you know, uh, Count Chocula. The Sturgis special that Jesse rode on that uh, that ride to Sturgis, that thing just fucking killed. Blue with the green flames. And, and then the Chongo Blanco, the rusty one, which I had. And 
and uh, Debt Dealer, which I had. Debt Dealer, I still think to this day, is the best riding chopper I had because it was a two-up with apes and mid-controls. I feel all choppers have to have mid-controls. That's just how it is. If it's a hardtail, you need to be able to stand up on the controls when big-ass fucking potholes and bumps are coming up, or you're just going to get your ass jackhammered and your lower back. That's why you see all those old school bikers. They're like 70 and they're just walking like, hey, oh, it sucks to be old. <laughs> you fucking kids with your shocks. That is insane. Anyway, so, okay, what is that? It's Death Dealer. It's Chongo Blanco, the rusted bike. It's Count Chocula. It's, um, it's the Sturgis Special. And then Indian Larry's bike with the twisted down tube. I think those are the five, pretty much the five greatest choppers. Although I've never rode or really got to really see it up close with is uh, James Hetfield's Papa Het bike, which is a knuckle. And it's a very small West Coast chopper two up just crusher. I just, you know, I, I just had such nostalgia when I went to this venue to uh, do some comedy. I was just like, bam, it hit me. I was like, God, man, those choppers out here. And it was such a time, that whole chopper thing. And I've over the years, I've interviewed everybody that I, I really respected in that chopper game, Roland Sands, which, oh, by the way, I did not include one of Roland's bikes. And I do believe that Roland is out of the you know jesse and roland to me are probably right there equal jesse jesse just doing the classic outlaw crushing bikes but roland sands would always go the extra mile man just crazy his his imagination and his wizardry on changing like a ktm bike into something crazy or getting a bmw and turning it into this and and they're all rideable that's the thing. These bikes are all rideable. Those OCCs, that Orange County chopper stuff, and, and then all that other chopper shit that came with the 300 back tires and all that bullshit. I've, I've clowned on it enough, you know. It was an era, and I get it. The unridables is what I call them. Most people are like, yeah, dude, look at this. Got a fucking 350 rear tire. Yeah, I took it off my tractor. Yeah. <laughs> The unrideables, you try to go into a turn and you just won't fucking turn and you crash. Um, I do like Jesse's, um, what's that fucking one bike called? The, uh, oh God, I'm drawing a blank on it. Oh shit, I can't remember. But he also has another frame that I had and I, uh, Dominator. God, I almost lost it. The Dominator is a killer riding bike if you have mid controls and a 200 tire his first dominators had 280 tires too big and i get it he was uh you know delivering stuff that people wanted they wanted the big tire anyway that's how i start the show with a little fucking memory lane i was in there doing comedy just thinking about those old times good week in a comedy about to hit the road gonna be out with bill burr all this week Tonight at the Troubadour, it's going to be epic to do comedy in the Troubadour with Bill. It's a, it's a incredible venue, and I would say it's probably my best favorite venue in L.A. I would say for sure. I don't know why, but it's just got this vibe and that old Eagles and Elton John history and Linda Ronstadt. And they've just kept it the same, you know? It's just so cool to think about. But we're there tonight. And then we catch a red eye out Wednesday and we, we do some shows on the East Coast. They're all on the website. Looking forward to that. Some uh, wild arenas. And in between that, I'll be headlining all over. I'm doing a week in Vegas at the Cellar. And I'm doing Utah, finally. Finally getting to go do Utah headlining at a new club out there, Boxcar Comedy. And, um, and oh, and I'm doing Flyover Comedy Festival. I think it's in St. Louis. These are all this year. They're on the website. So anyway, welcome to the show. 
and it's uh, great to have you here. This is a solo episode. And, um, you know, I, I enjoy doing the solo episodes. It seems like you guys are digging them. And I really appreciate you guys for uh, being here every week. A couple things I want to get into right away. Right away. <laughs> I saw the Wes Anderson film on Friday. Mr. Matt Dillon not name dropping because I, I, I don't know him. I just follow him on Instagram and I've been trying to get him on this podcast for, Oh, you know, we're going on almost 12 years now, Matt Dillon being one of my favorite all time actors and eh, Matt Dillon's kind of just done it right. He's been in Hollywood working in movies since he was like, I don't know how old he was on over the edge. But if you have not seen Over the Edge, what are you doing? It's one of the classic teen angst films. And I feel it doesn't get enough glory. And it was really the movie that combined rock and roll, BMX, uh, juvenile delinquents, and long hair. Just radical. And it's the movie that turned me on to Cheap Trick, but it's basically about this suburbs that they build out and outside of LA and kids move there with their parents. And then it just becomes this insanity. The kids just rebel against the suburb living. And I can totally relate to that. As a kid, you're just like, yeah, man, fuck the suburbs. I want to be in the city. I want to be around art and, and radicals. <laughs> <laughs> but Matt Dillon, it's just unreal. You know, he's he's been famous, but he he's never really been super huge. It's kind of like how Philip Seymour was until he did uh, Capote. Philip Seymour was one of those guys. He'd be in films and you'd be like, you know, that one guy. And he would just come into the movie and fucking steal the film. So Matt Dillon, you know just a long time fan of his and it's interesting I, and i got some friends that know him and i've been trying to get him on it's just has not happened he's on a, movie, a tv show right now called high desert which is uh on peacock i believe and that's getting great reviews and he's on the new wes anderson film my favorite matt dillon hands down is drugstore cowboy and that is just a goddamn masterpiece. And, you know, I, I, I saw Matt and talked to him for one minute uh, a few years ago. I guess it was like five years ago. He did that. He did, man, I tell you, he did one of the scariest serial killer films. It was so gnarly. They made it rated X. And uh, the house that Jack built. And it actually was the first movie that kind of fucked with me other than the exorcist when I was a kid, but that's when you're a kid, you go see the exorcist. You're like, Oh, I'm scared. Leave the light on. But this is more like this serial killer film is so twisted. And I, and you're, you're, you're hearing this from a man who watched Dahmer and night stalker. And I'm sure a lot of you guys did. And that's disturbing because you're going, these were real fucking people in our past. That is so insane. Dahmer and Night Stalker, these fucking people. But this movie, The House That Jack Built, it is, it is, it's gross and it's scary and it's crazy. Uh, so anyway, Drugstore Cowboy, House That Jack Built, and then the all-time masterpiece, Outsiders. Now, he's done a ton of films. Flamingo Kid. I could sit here and roll through his credits. That's not what it's about. I'm just amazed how, you know, he never got the DUIs. He didn't overdose somewhere. He was a child actor. All the child actors in my lifetime spun out, just became lunatics or died. You know, River Phoenix, uh, all these guys that were celebrities. Even uh, we were talking about it on Adam Carolla, uh, Danny Bonaducci. You know, like he he got cuckoo and 
Keith Partridge, any child star, I think you make all this money and you're fucking, you know, you, you become a huge star. And then all of a sudden they don't want you anymore. Most of the time, because you're not cute anymore. They're like, nah, you know, you, you look weird now. And that's what happened to that incredible actor um, from Bad News Bears, Jackie Earl Haley. Oh my God, he's such a great actor. He left acting and then came back and just dominated it. Being Freddy Krueger, he was in that other film that he got nominated at Academy Award for. But Matt Dillon's kept it together the entire fucking career. And he's way into art. He paints, he takes photos. I think he fucking spends a lot of his time in France, from what I can tell on his Instagram. The guy's a killer. The guy is a killer. Something about Mary, all of a sudden people are, whoa, Matt Dillon can do comedy? Anyway, he's in the new Wes Anderson. And really what this is about is Wes Anderson. I've been a huge Wes Anderson fan from the early days, you know? All those early films, Bottle Rocket. And, you know, he was popping off in that indie world back when they used to have a ton of indie films. I've talked about it before, you know, Drugstore Cowboy being another one. He didn't do that. But my point is there would be these indie films and you would go see them because you weren't into the blockbuster bullshit like myself. And now it's just superhero, 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 superhero. And then once in a while, uh, a Wes Anderson film will drop or a David Lynch film will drop or the Coen brothers will drop a film, stuff like that. A No Country for Old Men, a There Will Be Blood, uh, uh, Asteroid City, which is the new Wes Anderson film. Wes Anderson really blew my mind beyond with the Royal Tenenbaums. When I saw that movie, I was... I was so blown away because it was a perfect, perfect piece of art. It was just a masterpiece film. And all of the performances and the actors just killed it. Gwyneth Paltrow, just early on, crazy, cuts her finger off or whatever, chopping wood. Just all these weird side stories that would tangle into the main story. That's what I loved about Wes Anderson. Just really absurd, obscure, weird references, incredible fashion, smoke and music, always killing it. And Wes Anderson being a fucking weird ass cool dude too. Spike Jones, another guy. The you know, Roman Coppola, all these guys, man. They they just seem to deliver some of the greatest shit I've ever seen for years and years and and I cannot thank Wes Anderson enough for the entertainment and the uh, the influence of design and and filmmaking and and sets and everything. So my favorites, Ten and Bombs, A Life Aquatic, Moonrise Kingdom, and then uh, the rest of them I just love and find them entertaining. But those are the crown jewels for me. And, and then I love um, that Isle of Dog or that one. I like the cartoon Incredible Mr. Fox. I remember when I saw Incredible Mr. Fox for like a month, I couldn't stop talking about it. It was Claymation. And uh, I love Claymation. Everybody knows I love Gumby. I talked about it uh, many times on the podcast. I love Gumby. I love Claymation. I love Mr. Bill. I love all kinds of weird shit like that. But Incredible Mr. Fox, anywhere. It was early on when I started comedy. And I'd be out late night at diners with comics. And I'd be like, dude, you guys see Incredible Mr. Fox? I was that guy. And they'd be like, yeah, man, we're talking about it. You already talked about it. I'm like, well, fucking go see. Why aren't you guys seeing it? That's how I feel about this podcast. I'm like, you got to just tell your friends till they fucking go crazy. You listen to the Let There Be Talk or what? How are you not listening to Let There Be Talk? You listen to these other fucking podcasts. This one's been on 11 years. And it's fucking good. You should listen to Let There Be Talk. Dean Del Rey. <laughs> you got to make him fucking crazy. Anyway, so um, the reason I brought up Matt Dillon was uh, I follow him on Instagram. And then I, I got this DM that said, Matt is doing a buyout at the Sunset Five, which is my favorite movie theater in L.A., because they don't let anybody in under 21. 
So there's no fucking tools in there, you know, just fucking making noise and texting and shit. <laughs> and uh, I, 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 for years and years and years, would go to this movie theater on Monday or Tuesdays, usually Tuesday, because they have the $5 movie. And I'd go right at 1130 in the morning. There'd be no one in there. And I would enjoy uh, a movie together, which matter of fact, I uh, went to see, I think it was the Radiohead documentary at this particular theater, same style in the morning by myself. And I sat down and then the only other guy in the movie theater was Matt Dillon. And he came in and then he sat next to me, not right next to me, but in the same row. And I was like, I looked at him I'm like, at first I looked at him and I go, this fucking Matt Dillon. And then I was like, wait, there's the whole theater in here. But I think he said something like, well, I mean, you know, it's weird anywhere else, you know, <laughs> I can't remember what he said, but he said something funny. And I was like, yeah, that makes sense. But, uh, God, I did that. That memory is so funny. But this is my favorite movie theater. So Matt Dillon did a buyout, and then they um, decked out the entire movie theater in the um, the the like the sets of the movie or Asteroid City. They had all the sets and outfits in there, and you could take pictures and everything. It was, and there was people dressed up in other characters from other Wes Anderson films and. And people take that shit fucking, you know, to another limit, like a level. I mean, like a Rocky Horror picture show style, you know, they show up dressed in the tenon bombs, like the sweatsuits, or uh, they show up in Moonrise Kingdom in like Cub Scout outfits, or it's fucking cool. And it's really um, something that I could relate to. I, I don't find it weird at all. I, I I could easily slip into that showing up in my sweatsuit and headband. Like I'm part of that family, the Tenenbaums, you know, it's like those people at Disneyland that dress as the characters walking around Disneyland as the characters. What the fuck? Anyway. So I show up and it, it was like five in the afternoon and I didn't have a spot till I think 930. So it was perfect. I showed up. They give you free food and shit at these things. Uh, I don't need any of that stuff anymore. But I did have a little uh, popcorn and uh, snuck in a coffee. You can't ever bring in your coffee. So I just kind of put it in my jacket. I'm <laughs> taking a risk of it spilling. Just which by the way, yesterday, I got a coffee and I got in the car and the fucking asshole didn't put the top on all the way. Oh, I wanted to fucking murder this guy. I get in my car and the top pops off and the coffee just burns my fucking balls and leg, like full lawsuit mode. Just ah. And I was going to do a spot. I had to go home and change, almost missed my fucking spot. Just hot coffee all over the fucking Prius. Gertie's looking at me like, hmm? Oh my God. Fuck, man. You work at a coffee shop. You're dealing with fucking hot shit. Put the top on. What are you fucking doing? Oh, man. You know? That's when I root for the robots. You know, they're thinking, oh, we're going to have robots take these jobs. I'm like, at that point, I was rooting for the robots. I was like, I don't think the robot would fuck up. You know? And if the robot did fuck up, I wouldn't feel bad because I'd go in there and just fucking smash the robot. Can't go in and smash the employee. He probably smoked a couple bong hits. He's making no money. He doesn't even want to work there. I get it. Just dealing with people all day. I said fucking decaf, dude. This is caffeinated. I'm shaking in my fucking boots like a, an old Vietnam vet. I'm cooking down sunset here with the shakes. Sorry, dude. Sorry, man. <laughs> anyway, so the movie, uh, I saw Asteroid City. And it, it's not bad. And it's not his best. 
But that's the thing about Wes Anderson. Now, this is just my thoughts. You might love it, Asteroid City. I loved, if the movie story isn't great with Wes Anderson, you're like, well, I can just, you know, enjoy all this other shit, like the acting that's going on. Scarlett Johansson just crushing it, crushing it on this film. And he has every star. If they won an Academy Award, he's like, you're in my movie. There's like 18 stars, which, by the way, the poster is hilarious for Asteroid City. It doesn't mention any of the stars. It just says Asteroid City. And then it's got like a, a kid on a, a rocket pack. And then it says written by Wes Anderson, directed by Wes Anderson, uh, screenplay by Wes Anderson, Uh it, it, everything is Wes Anderson on the poster. I'm like, easy, dude. And then uh, co-written by Roma Coppola, real, real small. But it's like Wes Anderson, Wes Anderson, Wes Anderson. I'm like, all right, dude, we get it. You did it all. Just put written, directed, and screenplay Wes Anderson. One thing, one name right there. And then, you know, and then Roma Coppola. Not Wes Anderson, Wes Anderson. Wes Anderson. <laughs> I can imagine him they're doing the poster. He's like, hey man, I, I need my name on there. They're like, it's right here. Yeah, but I need it on again. I need all three credits. I want to get the Screen Actors Guild Healthcare. I want to get the Writers Guild Healthcare and Retirement. <laughs> and I want to get the Directors Guild Healthcare and Retirement. Anyway. So the movie is fun and it looks amazing. And I just cannot believe when I see his movies, especially this one, I'm like, how the fuck do you do that? You know, how, how do you, nobody else is making films that look like this. How do you do that? It's just insane. It opens with this train going through the desert and you're like, look at this. I fucking love this. Like, I think it would be so rad to have Wes Anderson direct my comedy special. Of course it would be rad. It would be mind boggling, but this is a dream. And then basically, if you're watching this on YouTube, you see my back, my backdrop right now. It would be cool that as I'm telling jokes, he would change the backgrounds and shit that go with the jokes. Like if I was telling a joke about the Elton John concert, now you're in the Elton John concert, but looking weird like this, like his films do. Because you're like, wait, is that real world? Or is it a, is it a set? Is it a model? Is it a green screen? What is that? I can't fucking figure it out. Is it just in a big warehouse and they build these funky, almost cartoony Flintstone looking sets. It's wild. It'd be so cool to have him just direct a comedy special. Not in my fucking special. <laughs> anyway, so I saw that. There's a lot of movies out finally. And um, I want to see Mission because I love Tom Cruise. And I've said it over and over years on here. He gets trashed. He's a Scientologist weirdo. He jumped on the couch. Who gives a fuck? This motherfucker basically saved the movie industry. Every time he drops a movie, they're like, oh, thank you, Tom. Your movie made more money than 40 of the movies out. And, uh, and it's not a superhero film, which is great. Inception's one of the greatest. Magnolia's a crusher. Fucking uh, risky business. This guy, this guy, another dude that, you know, other than what you think of as Scientology and shit, other than that, he never fucked up on drugs or drunk drivings or anything. He's a lunatic. But I'm really fired up to see this mission. I think it's the last one. And I must have watched, and if you haven't watched it, him shoot the motorcycle stunt. It's on YouTube and on his Instagram. I watched it about 40 times. You're talking about a guy who does all his own stunts and it's just mind boggling. I think he's around my age and I just cannot believe what the fuck he does. That one where he's holding on to the side of the plane when they took off 
and they show you he's really doing it, get out of here. Just, oh, the other one in Dubai where he's on the side of the fucking building, the highest building in Dubai. And this one where he does the motorcycle jump and the director's like, cut. He's like, it was perfect. We got it. And, and Tom's like, you know, I think I could hold on to the motorcycle a little longer. He does this death, death, death stunt. It is scary as fuck. If you've ever skydived, I skydived twice. That's scary. But then he's riding a motorcycle like 100 miles an hour, making evil Knievel look like a beginner, jumping, flying off a cliff, holding onto the bike, then letting go of the bike and dropping out a chute. He does it like 10 times in a row. What the fuck? Unbelievable. So I'm fired up to see Mission. I don't know anything about Flash because I don't fuck around with uh, superheroes. I remember the original Flash movie with Queen doing the soundtrack. Flash! Flash! Dun, 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 dun. Flash! Flash! I remember Queen toured that record. They played Oakland Coliseum. So wild. But I don't know anything about Flash, but I do want to see Mission. And I saw Wes Anderson's film. And uh, now I'll have to wait another couple of years for another Wes Anderson. And why I saw this Wes Anderson film, I forgot to say, I did not know that during COVID, this is how out of the movie world I was during COVID. Nobody knows what's out at all, even right now. And I'm doing a bit about it, you know, like, you don't know what's, you show up in the theater, like, what do you got? And the guy's like, I don't know, try movie theater three. <laughs> but um he Wes Anderson put out a film during COVID, that French one. I had no idea about it until Kevin Christie was like, it's my favorite. Have you seen it? I was like, oh, I didn't even fucking know about it because I was busy not trying to die from the deadly plague that people don't think exists that I got twice. <laughs> the flu. You got the flu. Oh, man. I don't know about that. I can't breathe and I can't see. And I got a fever for seven days. I'm fucking dying. Anyway, so um, there's some movies out right now and uh, looking forward to seeing Mission. I'll probably see it. I might see it on the road with Burr. That'd be cool. During the day, we got a day off. Just go see uh, Mission. Um, what else is happening? I want to give a, uh, a heads up to Jesse Malin, who is a friend of mine, uh, D-Generation, and of course, Jesse Malin, uh, you know, uh, playing the great rock band D generation had the rock club in, in, uh, New York, Coney Island. Uh, he did the podcast. Bill and I did his benefit, uh, with, uh, Jacob Dylan's uh, sister-in-law, uh, for Crohn's. I got a long, long history of friendship with Jesse Malin. He uh, he's an incredible singer, songwriter. Springsteen played on one of his fucking records. What a dream that is. He's basically what I would call the uh, the Prince of New York, man. The guy has been waving the rock and roll flag his entire life. He's a lifer like myself. He's out there doing art at the highest level and recently had a horrific thing happen to him. And I've never heard of this happening but it has happened to him. He is back. I guess his back or, or something in his spine had a stroke uh, from what I read in Rolling Stone magazine. Now, I reached out to him. I haven't heard from him. And, of course, I understand that. But there's a GoFundMe, and I will post it again on the Patreon and my, um, my uh, Instagram DMs. This is horrific. He cannot walk. Just out of nowhere, his legs don't work. He went to like a, a a dinner memorial for a friend who passed away. He ate dinner and he he got up and he couldn't walk. He can't move. He was in the hospital. Now they've got him in some kind of rehab place in New York City. And I'm going to try to go see him while I'm in New York in two weeks and just say hi and uh, and. I, you know, you can donate. I have the, uh, actually, let me get it right now because 
I want you guys to be able to donate to this. It is, uh, it is just awful. It is awful, and you never know what could happen to you, and you need good friends out there. Now, Jesse has amazing friends. Nobody doesn't like this guy. You know, if something happened to me, I'd probably have about 15 people, and the rest would be like, ah, fuck them. But, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Let me see here. I got I want to get this because I want you guys to um, – be able to donate to it and it's just horrible i i i just uh i feel so bad so here it is you can donate at sweetrelief.org and um slash jesse malin fund sweetrelief.org slash jesse malin fund and uh it is it, it it is just awful and uh you can also text to donate j e s s e text jesse to 53-555 okay that's text jesse j e s s e to 53-555, you can text, it's really easy. You can also mail in your um, your stuff or you can call 949-215-9620, okay? And uh, I just, I, I just, I, I just can't even tell you how, how awful this is, man. And it's, it's really, uh, I can't even say it's part of aging because I really don't know um, you know, if it's a freak thing, if it's, uh, what, it, what it is, is it, did he have some kind of, uh, spasms in the back that turn into shocking the spine? I don't know. I've had my own neck issues where my whole left side of my body was numb. So I know it's just, it's no fucking joke. When your health goes away, it is all of a sudden everything sucks and nothing matters except trying to get your health together. Like when I got diabetes recently, I just went and got, um, I get a physical every year. If you don't do this, I've said it before. What are you fucking doing? They have some of the best technology and why aren't you using it? If you have healthcare. Now, if you don't, like I didn't have healthcare for years. I understand you're just fucked. You got to roll the dice and wake up each day and go, Holy shit, I made another day. But if you have health care, why are you not fucking using it? This is just insane. Why aren't you getting your colonoscopy? Why aren't you getting your uh, physicals? Why aren't you getting your cholesterol checked and your blood pressure and all that? I, I just don't understand it. Because once you wait too long, you're just dead. That's just all there is to it. And they have all this great shit. Recently, I got a physical. My doctor, Dr. Ron, said, you know, you should get a calcium score. Like a calcium score. What the fuck is that? And I thought it was this when I, about five, six years ago, I remember Marin got this thing where they shoot dye into your heart and then they can look inside your heart really well. And I thought it was that, um, but it's not that. Now, Years ago, I thought I had a heart attack, but it was a panic attack. It was my first one ever. But when they looked at my heart, they did a sonogram of my heart. I'll never forget that. You just go in. It's like, you know, when they're checking uh, the woman when she's having a baby, they can do a sonogram and see what they're they're having. They're like, oh, there's the dick right there. It's a boy. Look at that dick. And then the dad goes, yeah, man, he's hung. <laughs> So I got a sonogram of my heart like six, seven years ago, I remember. And the guy just rolled this machine and he put some gel on your tit and then he rubs this thing on. And all of a sudden it's like, he's like, you want to hear it? I'm like, not really. And he turns it up and it's just. <laughs> he's like, listen to that, huh? I'm like, hey, dude, I don't fucking want to hear that. That's that's fucking scary. Here in your body. 
I mean, I heard my heart many nights laying in bed, high on coke, trying to sleep, going, please don't let me die. It's just... But this is with the juices, the blood going through, just... Imagine you're listening to it and all of a sudden it just goes... And stops. Oh, my God. Anyway... I didn't know what a calcium score is. So I enjoy kind of learning stuff as I'm getting older because you, you just don't know how long you got. And the calcium score will kind of help you. You know, you hear about these people with these things, the widow makers, where you're just walking around and boom, the guy had a heart attack. He instantly died in the Trader Joe's over in the cereal aisle. He's reaching for the fucking Toastios and bam. So my doctor's like, you know, your cholesterol's good. It's uh, everything's good, but you, you're at that age. You should get a calcium score just to know what's going on. I go, I don't know what that is. So I go get a calcium score. And it's basically like, a, it looks like an MRI machine, but it's a round donut. It's not a tube. So you don't have to go in the tube and it doesn't fucking sound like a, uh, a broke down rocket falling out of space like an MRI does. So you go and you just lay on this bed and then it just kind of shoots you through the tube like three times. It's, you go through and it's like, do not move, do not move, do not move. Then it slides out then it goes back in, do not move, do not move. <laughs> and they're like, this shit is crazy. Who the fuck invented this thing? Every time I'm in a doctor's office, I'm like, how is that not that thing not called the Larry? Whoever the guy is that put it together. Yeah, that's the uh, Stan and Larry machine. I invent the fucking calcium scan or the MRI. It's got to be my name. The Dean machine, right? Yeah, you got to go down and get your, uh, your eyes checked with the Dean machine. If you invent something that fucking monumental, you should put his name on it. Put his fucking name on that thing. You know? How are you going to call it the calcium score? Fuck that. Make it the fucking Steve and Larry or whatever the guy's names that fucking stayed up for six years and, you know, got divorced because they were never home. They're constantly working on the fucking giant donut that looks at your heart. And what it does is it can check... Hold on, I want to get this right because uh, I want you guys to go get it done if you're over 50 because it's it's painless. It's nothing to it. Dude, I was in there for like six minutes. I was gone. But what it does is it basically, um, it, it checks for evidence of calcium in your coronary arteries. Um, and basically it gives you a score, okay? Uh, this means you have coronary artery disease if you have like you know these high scores and this is one of the scary things that happened to me so the doctor emailed me and he told me my score he goes your score is 50 but he doesn't fuck it these doctors man call don't fucking email people man this this is something you don't email you don't email people uh on somebody died that you know close you don't email people's fucking, um, you know, health scores and diagnosis. Yeah, you know, said so basically, uh, Dean, your score is 50. And uh, hold on, I'll tell you exactly what he said. This is how fucking dumb doctors are. When you email somebody their, their fucking uh, results, you got to be like, Hey, it's 50, but don't worry. That's pretty fucking good at your age. Okay. He doesn't. Here's what he writes. Your calcium score is 50 on the CT scan, which is it is in the 50th percentile. The fuck does that mean? This means that if your cholesterol was elevated at all, you would have to go on a cholesterol lowering medication to reduce your risk of plaque buildup. Please send me your cholesterol test results from your doctor. Okay, that sounds like he's 
he's telling me what it is. But I was like, is this bad? Like 50? What is it? 50 out of 100? Is it 50 out of 58? Is it 50 out of 5,000? Well, it turns out it's 50 out of 1,000, okay? So I'm looking, and I, and I never Google test results because I don't want to freak myself out. I'd rather talk to the doctor, okay? But so it's a weekend now, and I can't call him. So I'm backstage at a show last night and this woman's in there and she's about my age. Maybe she's a little younger comedian. And I go, yeah, I just got a, a calcium score. And she goes, oh yeah, what was it? I go 50. And she goes, I guess 50. Like I'm, I should be dead right now in the green room. Like, how are you even alive? That was her response. 50. I go, yeah, what? She goes, mine was four. And I'm like, four, she must be talking about a different fucking test because, you know, 50. So now in my mind, I'm like, oh my God, I think it's really bad. And he just didn't tell me. Why wouldn't he tell me the way she answered? All of a sudden, she's the expert in my mind, right? I'm going to be dead on the drive home. I, I can't even believe I just told jokes. I'm, I didn't die. 50. Whoa. So I go home. I go, fuck this. I got to Google it. I can't sleep. I really couldn't sleep. So here it is. Uh, anything above zero, anything, means there's some evidence of coronary artery disease, which I was thinking, if you had zero, you fucking you haven't eaten anything in your life. I would like to meet a person that has zero, zero plaque at, at my age, 57. What the fuck, zero? Now, she said she was four. If that's real, that's pretty fucking good because they said one through 10 is, um, chances almost of none to get a heart attack in the next five years. Now, 100 or less, which I'm 50, moderate, or sorry, 100 or less, um, mild proof of coronary artery disease, mild. So this fucking woman, wrong response. Man, I was mad. Now, uh, over 100 up to 400. Now, remember, I'm 50, not years old, but my score is 50. There's people walking around up to 400 and that's only moderate amount of proof that you have some plaque above 400 strong proof. So I'm only at 50. So I'm like, Hey man, I'm doing pretty fucking good. I'm still going to change some things because I'm going to talk to the doctor tomorrow and see if I can bring it down. Like I did diabetes. Is there a way to eliminate that shit? Uh, reading, you know, walnuts, avocados, salmon, stuff like that. I got to lay off at this age now. I can't be doing steak all the time and barbecue. Like I've been burning it up for years. I'll fuck up some barbecue, man. Barbecue is absolutely my cocaine. So I'm looking forward to talking to them and finding out what I can do. But basically it said, and everything I'm doing is uh is it, it's what i'm doing is fine you know exercise more often i go to the gym every fucking day except sunday make changes to your diet i made changes when i quit sugar you know they're like don't be eating sugar don't be eating high fats I stay off the fucking salt i don't fuck with salt at all i never understood people that fuck with salt you ever see a guy you go out to dinner they get the salt and they're just fucking hammering for about a good three or four minutes, like they're rubbing one out, just shaking the fuck out of the sh salt. And, or, or the same people that pour a half gallon of sugar into their coffee. Look, you don't like coffee. You know, I know you need caffeine to wake up in the morning, but just get one of those fucking energy drinks that tastes like Kool-Aid instead of pouring a gallon of sugar into your coffee. You don't like coffee. I drink my coffee black. They're like, how? I go, it tastes great. I can't drink Starbucks coffee black. I 
splash a little oat milk in there because that tastes like fucking burnt shit. But a good coffee, like a boo bottle or any high end coffee shop, uh, you know, just tastes fantastic. It's like a rich, dark, chocolatey coffee flavor. Anyway, so, uh, and then it says get more tests, have more follow up visits, and uh, keep an eye on it. And uh, so there it is calcium score, man. Never heard of it. Glad they have this machine. And I'm glad I'm not too fucking far off because I think, you know, I always tell people, you know, when they're like shitting on another comedian, you know, oh, fuck that guy, fuck it, he's not funny or anything. I think, man, I don't have any enemies in the comedy world. Now, maybe people uh, don't like me or or my work drive or or my ethic or or you know, there's those people that they get jealous, like ah, fuck him, man. I don't have that. I never had that. I'm not competing with anybody except fucking myself trying to get myself funnier. My only enemies, and I've said it the last 10 years, are heart attacks and cancer. And man, heart attacks are scary as fuck to me because I did a lot of cocaine when I was young. And a lot of speed and a lot of fucking drinking and uh, that shit, I was lucky to get out. And I always say, I didn't overdose and die when I was young, but those drugs are going to get you later on if you're not constantly fucking trying to keep it together. You know, you're going to go to the doctor one day and he's going to go, yeah, you see that black spot right there? Yeah, like, yeah. And he's like, that's your partying from 80s, 90s, you know? with me I, I can't remember, 92 i think i quit partying um so i always think my heart took a fucking beating i've told that story before the numb arm at the gnr the axel playing november rain on the piano at that the team in mansion in laurel canyon that thing took some fucking time off my heart and you know it's uh I just looked it up yesterday's Father's Day. My dad died of heart attack at 79. Now I don't know what kind of uh fucking you know working out or anything he did because we did not talk. Uh my mom died at 78, and um which was just a, a little while ago, and she had a small heart attack, but she didn't work out at all. And she had diabetes, and you know, so. I I try to keep myself healthy, and I've said it before. I know it's super hard. If you're not happy in life, it's impossible to keep yourself healthy because you're gonna just eat shit. I, I, you know, I, instead of eating shit now, I fucking shop on eBay and then I go look. I got a house full of shit. What am I doing? So, um, you know, I I don't know. Nobody's guaranteed how long you're gonna live, but if I got 78 79 let's say you know that's not too fucking long left so i'm trying not to you know i'm trying to extend it i don't know why i'm trying to extend it i think maybe just so i can see how this planet ends <laughs> let's see how this motherfucker goes up anyway episode is brought to you by ergo speaking of health Ears are fried. I'm sure yours are too. If you listen to this podcast, everybody's got bad hearing. Just the world is loud now. It's way fucking loud. Car stereos are a hundred times louder than they were when I was a kid. We all are walking around with uh, headphones on all the time, just blasting. Uh, you know, cars are loud in general, motorcycles, rock concerts, everything. Our hearing is fried. Your hearing is going to go, and that is just a fact. And it's time to take the stigma off of hearing aids. I wear glasses right now. No one says shit. They're like, cool glasses. Eventually, people are going to be like, that's a cool hearing aid. And I think Ergo has a cool hearing aid because it goes in. It's small, like the size of a fly. It goes in your ear. You do not see it. And, man, your hearing will just come back to life. You can operate it all on your cell phone. Like in the movie theater, uh, yeah, I can finally hear movies. I, I can hear it. 
and uh, Ergo has a fine, fine hearing aid. You're going to get $360 off of these hearing aids if you use my code DEAN, D-E-A-N 360, the 360, the numbers. DEAN 360. Go to ergo.me slash Dean Del Rey. That's E-A-R-G-O dot M-E. Ergo.me slash Dean Del Rey and get $360 off these hearing aids. You don't need a prescription. None of that. They send them to you and then they give you a call and they go through the whole thing on how to set them up. And then you do a hearing test on your phone and bam, you're up and running. They stay charged forever. They got a cool little style and carrying case. You can keep it in your pocket and they're perfect. Ergo.me slash Dean Del Rey. Use the code Dean360. Woo, man. Pat Sajak, speaking of age, is finally retiring from the Wheel of Fortune. And I started thinking about that, man. What a gig. This guy has been on Wheel of Fortune since I was a fucking kid. I didn't look how many years because I didn't need to. I know Pat Sajak and Vanna White have been hosting this goddamn fucking game show their entire lives almost. And I was just thinking, talk about a kick-ass job. Now, look, I know he's burnt on it. There's no way he's not burnt on it. But in his mind, he's also got to think like, man, I went down, auditioned for this game show 100 years ago, got it. And Vanna and I have been on this fucking show forever. And I was just thinking, what a fucking crazy gig. A game show host, your whole, there's only a handful of people that could say I was a game show host for 30 years. There's re- very, very little game shows around right now. And the ones they have are just repeats of the old ones like Family Feud and, and uh, all of those, Family Feud, Crusher. And Family Feud and Wheel of Fortune, Jeopardy. You get some weird ass shit. You ever see those uh, Wheel of Fortunes where it looks like, you know, it almost looks like something like he takes it in the ass. And it's it's something like uh, it's in the air tonight or whatever. And the guy will say it. He takes it in the ass. Like uh, Pat St. Jack will be like, what? You know, or the family feud. I saw one. uh, What was it? Uh, Oh, names that start with, uh, I think it was like names that start with uh, H. And this guy said, Jose. (laughs) And and I can't remember. But, you know, over the years, the bloopers from these game shows are fucking insane, man. And they will make you laugh more than any comedian you'll ever see. Every time you watch it and you just go like, I can't believe it. Anyway, Sajak's going to retire. That is wild, man. They should do a documentary on that guy and him and Vanna and just talk about what that life was like showing up every day. I don't know what lot they shoot it on, but I'm sure it's here in LA on one of the lots like CBS or something. And maybe they shoot like three a day. So he only has to go once a week. That's how they do a lot of those game shows. What's that other one that the dudes on um, the comedian, uh, Price is Right. What's his name? He's a comedian. I know him. I can't fucking think of his name right now. Carrie something. Um, Anyway, that's another game show. I think they shoot like two or three in a day or something. Anyway, Pat Sajak, man. Good job, dude. You're out there fucking go get your calcium score and, and go hit a goddamn island and never look back. Turn off your phone. Get your money and go enjoy an island and just sip some margaritas, do some swimming, get yourself a dog and turn it off, man. You won. You were on TV your entire fucking life. It is wild. I started thinking about, would I host a game show? 
you know, because the game show is kind of like, I don't know what kind of, I'm not knocking it at all because it's a good gig, but I'm saying if you were a comedian or a musician, now, if you were, I don't know, Pat Sajak, I don't know what he did before that. Was he a weatherman? If you're like a weatherman or newsman or something, and then they offer you to, to do this, this gig as a, you know, game show host, I can get it. But if you're like a comedian or something and you start to host a game show, is there any creativity in that? I, I don't really think so. You're, I mean, there is, you're riffing, like the one dude that does the fucking family feud is so goddamn funny, man. Uh, it was at Montel or something. I can't remember, but he is fucking lightning speed with that crowd work, man. But is there any kind of creativity other than riffing with the gas? And, um, you know, I, 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 I don't think I could host a game show, even though I could use the money but that's another one of those things where you're selling your your dream and your creative process and your you know everything that you hope for for some job security. And if I wanted that, uh, you know, I would probably just like I, I don't know, I'd get in the watch world or. I mean, I sold motorcycles, but I know you just burn out on all that. I sold motorcycles, and after a while, you're like, "All right, I'm I'm over there. I, I got to get back into the. I got to get back into the creative world, man. It was fun for why it, it happened, and I made some good money and had health care. But after a while, I'm like, "Nah, I got this fucking itch," and uh, you know. So I don't know if I could host a game show. I I would do it if it was some kind of cool music game show or something like that, and I could still do comedy at night and they weren't like, you know, we heard a joke you told, so we're going to have to fucking fire you. You know, they try to get you to sign some fucking paperwork saying you won't do any edgy jokes. And it's like, nah, I'm out. Cause now I'm working for the man. I'm working for the man, the advertisers, the big budget advertising money anyway hats Jack though hats off man let, let me see i want to i'll tell you what i want to see what the fuck pat say jack did um cool name too right pat say jack i've never met a say jack uh let's see what he did oh first of all look at his net worth i bet he's got a lot of money Man, they got photos of him. He's real young. He's 76 years old. Fuck, man, that guy looks great. You know, that gig must be zero stress. He just looks killer. He's worth 70 million, which, by the way, that's always wrong. Sometimes uh, I said it before, but one time uh, my dad, who, you know, we never talked, he, I guess he hit that celebritynetworth.com and uh, he typed in my name and then it said, we're 7 million. And he just emailed me one night, 7 million. Nice. <laughs> it's like 7 million. I think they meant to say 7,000 bucks. You know, Pat say Jack. He's married twice. Let's see what the fuck this guy did before. Uh, you guys are like, I don't give a fuck what he did, man. Get to the records. I want to hear music. I want to hear what you talk about. It. He's got 19 nominations for daytime Emmys. Just a smoker. Uh, early life, born in Chicago. Graduated high school, then went to Columbia College, Chicago, while working as a desk clerk at the Palmer House Hotel. Served in the army. He was in the troops. He served for the country. He's a hero, as Bill would say. We got another one of our heroes. Oh, uh, he was an he was in the army as a disc jockey. You fucking guy during the World War, the Vietnam War. He was that good morning Vietnam, that fucking uh, Robin Williams. Good morning Vietnam. Say Jack hosted the same Don Busters radio show that Adrian Croner had, and the 14 months followed to Croner's tradition of signing on with Good Morning Vietnam. Who's that? That's the dude. That's fucking hilarious. Um, 
He uh, he won a contest on WLS, uh, became a guest team DJ. He started out as a fucking DJ. There it is. So he fucking won the lottery, man. He was just a, a radio DJ. And then he was an armed forces DJ. And, um, and then he, uh, what's this? Sajak admitted to botching President Richard Nixon's 1969 Christmas broadcast to the troops. He accidentally cut the feed off prematurely <laughs> upon realizing the era. Error, Sajak decided it would be best not to resume the feed. In the early 70s, he DJed for a year for Murray, Kentucky radio station. Yeah, so he's like a DJ. Oh, then there it is. Look, became a weatherman, just like I thought. Then he uh, became a news anchor and the NBC uh, LA News. Wow. This is, oh, no, no. Sorry, I got that wrong. Somebody from the L.A. News spotted Sajak working in Nashville and got him out to L.A. 81, Merv Griffin, who's the fucking king, asked Sajak if he would be interested in taking over the duties of Wheel of Fortune from Chuck Woolery, who was a fucking killer. Remember him, that Love Connection show? That show was fucking crazy. You'd send these people out on uh, some dates and then hear their dates. Oh, my God, that show was fucking funny. My mom and I loved it. Oh, God. Anyway, uh, uh, the president and CEO of NBC rejected hiring Sajak. Wow, this is crazy. And then, um, and then eventually hired him. God, so that was in what year? 1981. Anyway, pretty fucking wild. Rock and roll. Sajak had a small role as a Buffalo, New York newscaster in Airplane 2. Oh, God, those airplane movies are so fucking funny. Okay, that's enough of Sajak, right? You guys are like, look, man, we took fucking 15 minutes of Sajak. What is this solo episode, man? Tell some fucking funny shit or get into music. <laughs> that's that's what's going on in my head right now. I'm thinking that's what you guys are thinking as you're listening to it on your way to your fucking job or the gym or whatever. Great records came out Friday. It has been an onslaught of music over the last month. And uh, starting for me with that Avenged Sevenfold record. And now, of course, the king, Josh Homme, has dropped Another masterpiece, his new Queens of the Stone Age record. And it is just unreal in times of New Roman. This, this song, uh, Car Carnivore, it is so fucking good. This is, now listen, this record is one of those ones you got to keep listening to it because you're going to be like, oh my God, this is my favorite. Oh no, this has become my favorite. This record has so much depth. I'm just kind of like, oh, God, this thing is a crusher. Oh, my God. I can't believe it. It is so good. Now, I've had it for a couple weeks, uh, but I really didn't dig in hard until it was released because when they send me the advance, it's this funky system where you got to sign in each time drop a password so you don't share it with anybody. And it's, it's, it's difficult to listen to. But now the record's out, and I just rocked it nonstop. Paper machete, killer video, killer song. Carnivore, crushing. What the peephole says. Sicily. Emotion sickness is a masterpiece also. Straight jacket fitted. 48 minutes, 10 songs. Josh Homme has got another masterpiece under his belt very very cool record somebody said it sounds like something that could have came out between rated r and songs from the death and i could agree with that the guitar tones are unbelievable troy van lewin crushing it john theodore on the drums just delivering masterful grooves and of course josh is singing a lot of bowie-ish um flavor on this record and it's funny because at that um, 
at that uh, Taylor Hawkins, you know, uh, memorial tribute, he did Let's Dance and he sounded exact to Bowie. So I know there's a lot of Bowie love in it, in his blood right now. And my buddy Joey was talking about how much influence really, it seems that over the years that Chris Goss really laid on all of these desert guys, Chris Goss of Masters of Reality, who I think is the godfather of the desert sound. I still think Chris Goss and those first two Masters of Reality records are some of the best music that I've ever heard. And it's really, really cool to hear the, the lineage of these two humans, Josh and Chris Goss. They, you know, when I first, I was around during Songs of the Dead. My buddy Casey took me down to the studio. I watched them record some of uh, Songs from the Death. I believe it was at Conway. I remember being there, they were tracking and Nick Oliveri was like just laying down vocals and we were hanging out, Chris Goss was there and that whole magic energy. And it has spilled over the years through all of the work of these guys. It's amazing how original Josh Homme sounds. It is beyond me what is going on with the originality. Nobody. He sounds like nobody. Chris Goss sounds like nobody. They are so original and the art is at the highest level. The lyrics on this record, what Josh has been through with the cancer diagnosis and the divorce and just a fucking you know, all of the wrath that he takes. It's unreal how strong this man is. And he's an influence to me. And his, his level of art is mind blowing to me. His songs, his, his singing, his guitar playing. There's no generic standard riffs. There's no bullshit on any Queens, even the last record he, record he did, Villains, if you didn't like that, I, I liked a lot of it. And I thought it was amazing that he went somewhere else. Now, here he is dropping this record. He is the David Lynch, the Wes Anderson, the Coen brothers, the, the you know Coppola of rock and roll. He just makes something that you look forward to and you're so happy that it is out in the world. And uh, I'm looking forward to seeing these songs live. I've been watching some clips. They're over in Europe touring right now. And it's just unbelievable. I'll tell you this. A couple other records came out on Friday that are mind boggling. This King Gizzard and the Lizard Wizard record, who I don't know why people constantly recommend this band to me. I've been listening to them for years. I've seen them live many times. I've tried to get them on the podcast a few times. It, it, it's not worked. But this is another band that is mind boggling to me how great they are and how original they sound and how prolific they are, constantly putting out records, constantly tour, uh, touring. And this record is unreal. First of all, it has the dumbest name, man. It, the record, the title of the record is so fucking long that, I mean, look, I mean, it's not dumb, but it's like, what are you doing? Petro Drag Dragonic Apocalypse or Dawn of Eternal Night and Annihilation of Planet Earth and the beginnings of merciless damnation. Now, look, I'm not, I'm not stupid. I know how to read. That's just how slow it's scrolling when you pop it up on the streaming platforms. It's just this long fucking album title. It's up there with that one that Fiona Apple had that one time. It was just like blah 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 blah. It's a it's a fucking album title. 
What are you doing? That's not going to be on the cover. The cover, by the way, is fucking beautiful. Ah, uh, you can't. Can you see it? Let's see. Ah, uh, you can't fucking see it. There it is. It's just a badass fucking lizard with the end of the world. Looks like just nuclear plants blowing black soot in the sky to breathe in. This record crushes. Crushes. Queens of the Stone Age and King Gizzard drop records on the same day and your head just blows off. All right? And then my friend, Nick Perry and the Underground Thieves, who had Nick Perry on uh, a few years ago, he dropped a new record. And he is uh, a goddamn soldier out there. He's been, um, you know, uh, doing rock and roll on his own terms, paying for the record himself, selling all his equipment to keep paying for it, recorded it at home. He moved out of LA to move somewhere cheaper. I think he moved back home to like Pennsylvania or something like that. And he puts out this, I think it's a double record. It's 14 songs. And he drops a record. And I'm not going to lie. The first song I did not like. And I was like, uh-oh. Is he is he chasing a war on drugs sound? What's going on? This is because I love Nick Perry's last record. And it had that Pink Floyd kind of cool desert psychedelic weird sound. But then I get to the second, third, fourth, fifth song, six, seven, eight, all the way up to eight. That's where I'm at right now on this record because there's so many records this weekend. But I Won't Change, great fucking song, Nick Perry. Modern Man, this record is really fucking interesting, man. And it is really unique sounding. And um, his guitar playing and singing, this guy could play the fuck out of the guitar. His singing is a, a, amazing. The record's called Terra Firma. Uh, T-E-R-R-A, and then second word, Firma, in case you can't spell like me. Album cover looks amazing. Now, I'm all the way up to the track eight, but I'm telling you, dig into this. It has got something special to it. And I'm looking forward on my long flight out to the East Coast to uh, listen to the rest of it, you know? So those are the records out right now that I'm absolutely loving. I want to give a shout out to the new Patreoner back to uh, return again, Kevin Connell. Thank you for joining the Patreon, patreon.com slash Dean Del Rey for bonus episodes and Zooms. I've been uh, hanging out on Zoom lately with a lot of people on Patreon. That's been fun as shit. Very good. And uh, tour dates, deandelray.com. Also, don't forget, you're looking for a custom guitar. I'm going to leave you with this. Banker Guitars. Go to Mr. Banker on Instagram. Tell Matt I sent you. Get yourself a custom boutique guitar by the best. This guy is the best out there making custom Karina Vs, Karina Explorers. I just saw that... Um, he made Mastodon some more guitars. He also made Marcus King some more guitars. He's got this incredible gold V that uh, that he just finished that blows my mind. He's doing arch top Vs. The guy is next level. His guitars are smoking. Mr. Banker. Bankerguitar.com. Go see him. Call him. Tell him Dean Del Rey sent you. Do yourself a favor. Uh, I love all you guys. I will see you out on the road. Thank you for tuning in again. And um, tell a friend about the podcast. Leave a review on Instagram. Please leave a review. Somebody, a couple people left a review last week. Two. Look, that doesn't sound like a lot, but two keeps it up in the top 50 on iTunes. Leave a review. Hey, I like this guy. He talked a little too much about Pat Sajak. I don't know what the fuck that's about. But other than that, he taps into uh, some weirdness. And, uh, you know, now I'm digging down into some Patch Sajak rabbit holes. Thank you for turning me on to the Sajak. <laughs> I don't know. I'm fucking, I'm out of my mind. Tour dates, DeanDelRay.com. See you out on the road. Candles are lit.